to welcome this is Richard Stanford. Today we have a really interesting period of time in Dallas history that most of you watching are going to be uh, familiar with. Uh, the book is Nut Country, Right Wing Dallas and the Birth of the Southern Strategy by Professor uh, Edward Miller. Most of us lived through that and we remember very well the mid late 50s into the mid 60s and that's the 10 year period that this book primarily covers. Uh, you remember the period. The period was, a, was the Cold War. The House Un-American Activities Committee, uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, uh, as a kid, I just loved reading all J. Edgar Hoover's books about the communist conspiracy and all that. Uh, in fact, uh, most of us uh, uh, who are in our 70s now were uh, young uh, public school kids who learned to duck and cover. You would jump under your desk and you would and you would shelter your 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 neck and and bend down so that the blast uh, would maybe not get you. And so, uh, heck, even as a child, I, Dr. Willard Libby, a famous Nobel Prize winner, as a child, I remember buying his famous twenty-eight dollar bomb shelter and and trying to and trying to construct one. I drove I I went on the sides of hills and dug dug. Uh, dug out little caves and things so I would be protected from the nuclear warfare that was going to come in the great war between the Soviet Union and the United States. So uh, it was kind of a paranoid time. In fact, one of the great books of that period is by Richard Hofstetter, uh, The Paranoid Style in American Politics. That's from the mid-60s. It's still an American classic text and you can still see echoes of that paranoia in today's politics. It, it's still with us. But, uh, but this was the period not only of, of duck and cover and the communist menace and, and the blacklist in Hollywood and making sure that uh, uh, communists uh, didn't, didn't infiltrate the American government, uh, uh, all that Cold War stuff. But this was also a period of very strained race relations, as you remember. Uh, Brown versus the Board of Education was decided in 1954. Uh, the the um, uh, the um, Warren Court, uh, and it was decided, but it wasn't decided in the South. The decision of the Warren Court that uh, uh, overturned the old 1890s case Plessy versus Ferguson that separate could be equal uh, uh, basically was not popular because it found that separate could not be equal and that schools needed to be integrated. Uh, the South was not ready for that in 1954, and you know what happened. All the Southern governors in the, in the, uh, the schoolhouse doors, the Orville Faubuses in Arkansas and the Ross Barnetts in, in Mississippi and, and uh, George Wallace's in Alabama, all came during the next few years. And, and at race, besides the Cold War and political paranoia, race was a big piece. And has anything changed? I'm giving this talk at about the time uh, we're still experiencing uh, protests all around the United States having to do with race. Um, one thing that you will learn from this book that you may not know and that will inform your knowledge uh, of why a certain Texas Ranger statue has just been removed from Love Field uh, is the situation at Mansfield High School in 1956. Um, the ranger whose, poor, whose bronze was in the airport as long as I can remember that just got removed, uh, he, was, he was the ranger at Mansfield High School in 1956. So it's not just a, a, a backlash against a ranger uh, issues with Hispanics over the course of the rangers, but it's a backlash against Mansfield because this statue was of that particular man. Uh, now, what happened at Mansfield High? I would bet you lived through it and you probably don't even remember. Uh, you remember, I suspect, 1957 at Central High School in Little Rock. Uh, Governor Faubus says, we're not letting those students in. And President Eisenhower calls out the National Guard and says, yes, you are. Uh, the Little Rock concentration is, is so famous in history. That could have been Mansfield, and this book uh, has a lot to say about Mansfield in that period. 
Uh, what happened? We're talking, we're talking summer of 1956. We're talking about Mansfield High School here in the Fort Worth area. Uh, Mansfield High uh, received a federal order that they would allow a student, a black student, to be admitted as a student at Mansfield High School. The mayor said, no. The, the, the city police said, no. Governor Shivers sent the Texas Rangers, but not to enforce that federal order, to help resist that federal order. Uh, in, other, in other words, the Texas Ranger that was sent uh, was, was uh, to, to aid the police of Mansfield and the, the city of Mansfield. Uh, the principal of the school was told that uh, uh, the flag flying over the school was upside down, which was a sign of, of distress. Uh, and they asked him when he was going to take it down, and he said, well, I didn't put it up, and I'm not taking it down. And so basically, uh, Mansfield High and Mansfield were in complete uh, opposition to the federal order to let a, a black student uh, come into Mansfield High School. 400 people were being gathered in the Mansfield area to resist this person coming into Mansfield High. And, and I would bet that your question right now is, how'd that happen? The governor wasn't cooperating, the city wasn't cooperating, the school district wasn't cooperating. Where is the Eisenhower administration? I mean, you saw what they did in Little Rock in 1957. Interesting fact that governs all of what happened and why we don't know about Mansfield the way we do Little Rock. Uh, just, just a freak of timing. Uh, President Eisenhower was running for re-election in November of 1956, and he just didn't want to stir the waters ahead of the presidential election of 1956. And that's why Mansfield wasn't the Little Rock. Uh, the next year, he was already re-elected president, and he could send the National Guard into Little Rock. So Mansfield was a telling uh, event in, in the history of racial segregation resistance in Texas that came after Brown versus Board of Education. So a little piece of Texas history that's really not known to a lot of people. And ironically, for those of us who were alive in 1956, most of us don't remember. But that's what happened in Mansfield. Now. Uh, it's not only the Cold War, the, the Russians, and, and, uh, um, and, and maybe I should say more about the paranoia that came out of that. Some of the movies we love to watch, um, Seven Days in May with Burt Lancaster and, and Kirk Douglas, uh, a general, James Mattoon Scott, plots to overthrow the President of the United States, played by Frederick March. There was this feeling that, that you know, there was a uh, sometimes communist, sometimes authoritarian uh, deep state military that, that might take over our democracy. Uh, think about the Manchurian candidate that came out in the early 60s with uh, um, uh, a number of, Lawrence Harvey was the Manchurian candidate, a man, a man brainwashed in Korea and, and, now, and, and now sent back to shoot uh, a prominent American politician uh, running for president. And so he was the Manchurian candidate. And so the communist menace was all around us. And so Cold War, race, and like I said before, a good deal of paranoia that went along with that. And that's really interesting. It's reflected in those movies. It's, it's even, it's even uh, parodied in those music, movies. If you ever saw Dr. Strangelove, How I Learned to Love the Bomb. Uh, Dr. Strangelove was, uh, was written, the, the, the screenplay was written by Terry Southern, who was a Dallasite. He grew up in Dallas. He was in Southern California then. He grew up in Oak Cliff. And uh, Terry Southern knew Dallas pretty well. And when General Jack Ripper says, uh, takes uh, Mandrake aside and says that, that the worst danger to America is fluoridation of water, uh, uh, it's, it's meant as a joke, and an inside paranoid joke, but it's a stab at the John Birch Society. It's a stab at General Edwin Walker, who we'll talk about later. But race, uh, 
communist opposition, paranoia, uh, it was all present in Dallas in the 1950s and the 60s. Uh, I, I know, I can, I can testify, my aunt was uh, the associate editor of, of Facts Forum, and, and, uh, um, which was H.L. Hunt's uh, basic uh, outlet for, for far-right conservative uh, stuff. And, uh, she also worked for Dan Smoot, who was located here in Dallas. Dan Smoot was a famous anti-communist culture warrior of the, of the 60s, uh, officed over in Lakewood. Dan Smoot Report was, uh, was a, a, another far-right piece. Dallas was kind of known for that, and, and so uh, the, the paranoia was here. Um, uh, and it's maybe best, best summed up in... in the formation of the John Birch Society, which took place out in California. Uh, the paranoid right-wing stuff in California centered on Orange County, Santa Ana, so my, my aunt obviously lived out there for a while. Kent and Phoebe Courtney in New Orleans, she worked for them for a while. And Dan Smoot here and H.L. Hunt and all those. Um, it, was, it was basically a, uh, an organization that, that believed kind of in the deep state, but a different kind of deep state than we get now. We think now when, when, when people start talking about deep state and elites and all that, that that's something new in American history. Not new at all, this idea that, that they're deep state elitists who control everything. Uh, the John Birch Society was named after a guy named John Birch who was, who was uh, killed uh, back in the Korean era and or World War II era, I forget. but. But it was formed by Joseph Welch, the candy maker, uh, uh, and, and also his co-founder, interestingly, uh, was the father of, uh, of the Koch brothers. Their dad, you know, they, they continue, one, one has now died, but they continue to be some of the great funders of, of right-wing stuff. Uh, the Koch brothers' father was co-founder with Robert Welch of the John Birch Society. And it understood that the United States had made a very large mistake when it became part of the United Nations, that the United Nations was basically a communist organized organization. Uh, so you stayed away from the U.S., uh, from the U.N., you, you, uh, you had an understanding that people like Eisenhower and Marshall were actually fellow travelers. And if not fellow travelers, they had coddled communists all along. And so there was this real, this real uh, suspicion of deep state liberal elites that went on. Um, uh, I, I'd, I'd mention that line that Terry Southern did in, uh, in uh, Strange Love. Uh, there was all kinds of literature in the John Birch Society about the communist plot to destroy our children by the use of fluoridation of water. Now, most dentists today say fluoridation is a wonderful thing. There are still people, this stuff goes on, there are still people uh, who oppose the fluoridation of water and consider it some kind of uh, elite trickery or scientific manipulation. But fluoridation of water was, was uh, one of many issues. Uh, that's why coming out of the mouth of General Jack Ripper in, in Dr. Strangelove, fluoridation of water, you knew exactly if you were from this area you knew exactly what, uh, what uh, Terry Southern was writing about. He was writing about that kind of paranoia. Now, um, a lot of attacks were made on, on professors out at SMU, a bunch of liberals, uh, you know, uh, and somebody who, who, head, who headed the, uh, the, the vanguard in attacking that was J. Evans Haley, famous Texas author, wrote the, the premier biography of Charles Goodnight. Uh, but but Haley was Haley was a culture warrior in that era, and and uh, was always after SMU related period people who were uh, promulgating uh, uh, liberal thoughts. Uh, interestingly, back in that period, Snyder Plaza had the American Bookstore, which was a famous conservative bookstore. But but the John Birch Society uh, took the forefront in a lot of this, and and uh, and maybe the most interesting person to come out of all of this came out of this in the early 60s, was the model for General Jack Ripper and Dr. Strangelove was General Edwin Walker. General Walker lived on uh, 
Turtle Creek house is still there. I pass by it almost every day. It's been redone. But General Walker always flew his flag upside down because America was in trouble. Um, uh, General Walker had, had uh, been a division commander in Germany, but he was handing out all this John Birch type stuff to his soldiers, and the Kennedy administration became very uneasy about what was going on in that division, and, and, and basically, uh, basically discharged General Walker, and, and he, ha he had to come home. Later, uh, and, and this is this, in, in Birch Society, this was one of the great scandals of all time. Later, the Attorney General, uh, Robert Kennedy, had General Walker committed for a few days for psychiatric evaluation. They thought he was bonkers. Uh, but G General Walker was very, very popular. Nice looking guy, couldn't talk his way out of a paper bag. That was one of the problems. Uh, at one time, uh, some conservative Republicans wanted to run him for governor, but, but uh, John Tower and some others said, no way, that man has no speaking skills and, and, and he's just a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit out there. And so he, so he never ran for governor. But uh, General Walker came back, lived on Turtle Creek, uh, was a darling of the John Birch Society. And, and uh, let me read you a little bit about General Walker. Just give a chance to give you a, a sense of the flavor of uh, nut country. Um, Walker's zealotry and obsession with conspiracy theories were so great that at times they crossed the line into paranoia. He questioned former President Eisenhower's loyalty, defended Robert Welch's assertion that Eisenhower was a communist, rejecting as nonsense the argument that Eisenhower wanted coexistence with the Soviet Union. Walker accused him of initiating a policy of conversion that Kennedy was perpetuating in 1962. We are converting our advantage to the enemy's advantage. At a press conference at the Baker Hotel, he appeared to channel Joseph McCarthy when he held up what he termed a State Department blueprint that supposedly placed American military personnel and weapons under the control of the United Nations. The executive branch and the Supreme Court had been captured, he said, and the plan now was to UNize the American soldier. Oh, you see, all that stuff, what you're going to do to the American soldier, the Manchurian candidate, the uh, you know, capture, uh, uh, cap uh, internationalist elite forces have captured the United States under the Kennedy administration. Uh, it was all led up to by the complicity of the Eisenhower administration, uh, top international elites. That's why with my aunt and all the others in John Birch Society, the, the names you did not want to use were Rockefeller or the Trilateral Commission. They had their pets that they thought were part of the international communist conspiracy. Uh, how, let me read again. However conspiratorial and bizarre these views might appear, they pale in comparison to his remarks during a December address when he described an international communist conspiracy that, that to his mind had penetrated the highest echelons of government in an almost pathological paranoid fantasy. Walker accused the left-wing media and Chief Justice Earl Warren of conspiring with Nikita Khrushchev to aid in the election of John F. Kennedy. Have you heard that before? In interestingly, the, um, uh, Walker believed that, that Khrushchev had been a uh, force in the election of Kennedy. We fight those issues yet. Um, now, um, I want to talk about Jim Walker was just a real interesting, real interesting fella, and he kind of faded out because he really was just way too eccentric and way too, too, uh, uh, too ineffective as a speaker. But, um, but that kind of that kind of rhetoric uh, just, just resonated with people. Um, is anything different today? Is always the question. There, this very morning. Uh, there was an article in the Dallas Morning News that said uh, uh, five Republican chairs, county chairs, including a chair in Bayer County, have been tweeting that the death of George Floyd was caused by George Soros in order to discredit President Trump. These are five people who head major uh, 
organizations in their counties. So has the paranoid style in American politics gone away? Nah. The internet has helped it a whole lot, but, but it, it hasn't gone away. Um, uh, I want to talk about the election of 1956 particularly. We had a, a, a congressman named uh, Bruce Alger. Now Bruce was, was a moderate, he was a World War II veteran, handsome guy. He, he, he won the election of 1954, Republican. Um, but come 1956, after, after Mansfield, after Brown versus Board of Education, um, he, he, he attracted a, uh, an opponent in that election. Henry Wade, the district attorney of Dallas County. Uh, now I'm again in, in, in areas that I know about because I knew Henry Wade and I, t I talked a good deal with Henry Wade. Uh, Henry, Henry ran on a more segregationist platform and as, in fact, Henry was noted for saying, uh, I can whistle Dixie. <laughs> and so, and so uh, basically Bruce Alger got the idea and went from being moderate to being relatively segregationist in order to win his office. He did beat Henry Wade in the election of 1956, but uh, Bruce Alger became, became the local congressman who was most identified with conservative causes. Uh, uh, in fact, he set a record at one time uh, in a vote of 348 to 1. He was the one dissenting voter uh, saying that you should not provide free s milk to school children. Uh, because he thought it was a socialist uh, experiment. And so, uh, so Bruce went way out there and, and, uh, and, and was pretty popular in Dallas. But he, he had been a moderate. He got pushed to the right, uh, but he found strength there both in segregationist matters and in, in kind of hardcore conservative uh, matters and, and was a congressman through this whole era. Uh, so, but something happened... Um, during the election of 1960 that I think is real interesting. And in fact, I'm going to read part of it. Um, as you remember, Richard Nixon ran against John Kennedy. John Kennedy's vice president was a Texan, Lyndon Johnson. And there's a very famous scene that I want to read that took place in the lobby of the Adolphus Hotel uh, just before the election of 1960. Uh, Bruce Alger had staked his territory and he had come out with all the Republican women of Dallas. Uh, that, that was a very strong organization. Rita Bass was a big Republican woman. The Republican women of Dallas and with a lot of those women in, in very well dressed with signs um, milling about the lobby and Lyndon Johnson ready to arrive and Bruce Alger there to, for, a, for a sort of a uh, political statement. Uh, this is what happened in the lobby of the Adolphus Hotel and it was a really interesting event in Dallas. And, uh, surrounded by 300 supporters, Texas Congressman Bruce Alger vigorously pumped up and down a placard declaring LBJ sold out to Yankee Socialists. Other signs read LBJ Trader, Judas Johnson, and Let's Ground Lady Bird. It was November 4, 1960, four days before the presidential election. And Alger and the crowd, primarily Dallas Republican women, stood outside the Adolphus Hotel in downtown Dallas and inside its lobby, waiting for the arrival of Lyndon B. Johnson, U.S. Senator from Texas, running mate of the Democratic presidential nominee, John F. Kennedy, and his wife, Lady Bird. Alger and the women certainly had no love for Kennedy, whose recently adopted party platform included the most liberal civil rights plank in the country's history. Moreover, as Dallasite Stanley Marcus of Neiman Marcus quipped, worse than being a papist, Kennedy was suspected of being against the oil depletion allowance, which allowed oilmen to reduce their taxable income by 27.5% of their gross profit. Funny joke. Same joke as in the Wheeler Dealers movie. Uh, don't take away our depletion allowance. Uh, like many Southerners, Alger and the women, many wearing white blouses, red coif hats, navy blue sailor collars, 
red satin scarves from a campaign event earlier that day, were angry that Johnson had agreed to join the Democratic ticket in the first place. They vowed to defeat, as one Austin paper editorialized, the Yankee from Boston and the turncoat from Austin. So Lyndon arrives, walks into the Adolphus, handled the situation masterfully into his political advantage, presenting himself as a martyr, using the occasion to reinvent himself, shedding the image of a drawling regional politician beholden to the depletion allowance and states' rights. He became a national figure acceptable to a wider constituency. Upon seeing the protesters and the television cameras, Johnson purposely slowed down, took 30 minutes to walk from the entrance of the hotel to the elevator. He told the Dallas police to stand aside and rejected requests from the commander of the Texas National Guard to remove the, protest, uh, the protesters from his path. As Bill Moyers, a Johnson aide, observed, he knew it got votes for him the moment it happened. He knew. The event was a fiasco for the city of Dallas and the local Republican Party. Despite Alger's assertion that the demonstration was good-natured and courteous, the front-page photo of the congressman holding his Annie Johnson sign and the stern visages of people in the crowd exacerbated and solidified the city's image as inhospitable. And Alger's party is absolute and reactionary. Criticism of Alger and the Republican Party grew locally as well. The usually friendly Dallas Morning News admitted that damage was done. Many of Alger's supporters deemed the incident unwise. Shortly after one Dallasite observed, Bruce Alger is still haggling with the lamplighter at Maine and Ackard. Claiming a monop monopoly on Americanism is one thing, but representing a bustling metropolitan area like Dallas in the jet age is a different and serious matter. Alger privately confessed to friends that holding the sign was ill-advised and his actions had hurt the party. The Kennedy-Johnson ticket won in Texas by 46,233 votes, capturing the presidency for John F. Kennedy. In the final analysis, the Adolphus incident presented a crisis for Dallas Republicans. The city began to be seen as a center of burgeoning extremism and its Republican par Party as a force behind it. Outspoken Bruce Alger, the only U.S. congressman to reject federal milk money for school children, suddenly realized the need to moderate the public perception of his zealotry and his reactionary world view. Okay. Um, I'm not, I don't think Kennedy won Dallas, uh, Kennedy, Dallas County, but Kennedy did win the state. But, but that was Dallas in 1960. Um, uh, you, you know, and I've, I've also need to mention something else that also riled, and, and I have some personal experience with, that riled the... Uh, uh, the politics of that era, and that was school prayer. Ironically, I was only 13 years old. My dad, my dad was being admitted to the Supreme Court of the United States. Back then, you had to do it personally. Uh, uh, not so much because he expected to practice before the Supreme Court, but just because he wanted to. And, and it, was, it was a great trip. He probably deducted it. I think he did. Uh, the family went. We visited my step-grandmother in Arlington, Virginia, and, and uh, and he had a friend, Ramsey Clark, who was the assistant attorney general, later the attorney general under, under uh, Lyndon Johnson, but the assistant attorney general under John Kennedy, serving directly under Robert Kennedy. And uh, so Ramsey introduced him. I remember Archibald Cox was the solicitor general of the United States. He, he introduced everybody else. I, as a 13-year-old, I was really impressed because uh, Ramsey's dad, uh, uh, Tom Clark, was... Uh, one of the few people on that court who's ever been from Texas. Our Justice Center down in Austin is the Tom Clark Center now, but, uh, but Tom Clark took us to his office and we talked some. And, and, and anyway, I was so thrilled. I sat in, a, uh, in that little space and I looked behind me and there was Ethel Kennedy, the Attorney General's wife, the, the President's uh, sister-in-law, and I was so impressed. But, uh, but all I remember as a 13-year-old were a bunch of really old guys walked into that room. Oye, oye, oye. And in walked, uh, Earl Warren looked ancient. They all looked ancient. This was the era of William O. Douglas and John Marshall Harlan and Hugo Black. These were all guys. Felix Frankfurter was still on that court. Uh, these, were the, these were the oldest guys I had ever seen. I was just amazed. 
And you know, I've missed the whole point of that day because the reason I'm saying this is that was June 25th of 1962, uh, the last day of that year's session. Um, we're about now to come to the last day of this year's session, which will announce very many important cases. But that's when they announce all their most recent important cases. One of them was Engel versus Vitale out of California. Engel versus Vitale is better known as the school prayer decision. So I was there for the reading of the school prayer decision. I remember nothing about it. I just remember how old those guys were. But, but the bottom line is out of that decision of the Supreme Court came a, came a hostility that was incredible uh, towards, towards the Supreme Court, towards the federal government, and towards anybody who would take away uh, the right of, of schools to have children pray Christian prayers in the schools, the school prayer decision. And you know that's been fought about ever since. That's still a political topic. So uh, anti-communism, race, school prayer, too strong a federal government is what that really symbolized to everybody. All of that combined with just a whole lot of, a whole lot of paranoia created the John Birch Society, created uh, Dallas far hard right politics, and, and, uh, and as, it, as the author said, made it a little bit embarrassing after Kennedy's election to have gone quite that far to one direction. Uh, and I'll tell you what came up uh, within a thousand days or so after that was the assassination, and that changed a whole lot of things. Uh, uh, basically, as you remember in, in, in October, Adlai Stevenson had come to Dallas and some protester who thought, you know, he'd been the UN, uh, was a Democratic candidate for president, he'd been the UN uh, person for the United States and, uh, and some lady, whether advertently or not, hit him over the head with her little paper placard and, and, and basically uh, Adlai went back to Washington told the president, don't go to Dallas. Um, and so uh, that started, and, but the president was going to go to Dallas. It was an important campaign stop and, uh, and uh, you know what happened, but um, you may not remember the vitriol that still existed, um, the Americanism, all that. I'm going to read something that's not in the book, but that's mentioned in the book. Ted Dealey uh, was the editor of the Dallas Morning News, um, and, and the Dallas Morning News uh, put in an article um, the morning that the president was to arrive, November 22, 1963. Um, welcome, Mr. Kennedy, to Dallas, um, a city so disgraced by a recent liberal smear attempt that its citizens have just elected two more conservative Americans to public office. Um, I'm going to edit some of this. Um, a city that will continue to grow and prosper despite efforts by you and your administration to penalize it for its nonconformity to new frontierism. A city that rejected your philosophy and policies in 1960 will do so again in 1964, even more emphatically than before. Mr. Kennedy, despite contentions on the part of your administration, the State Department, the Mayor of Dallas, the city, Dallas City Council, and members of your party, we free-thinking and American-thinking citizens of Dallas still have, and through a constitution largely ignored by you, the right to address our grievances, to question you, to disagree with you, and to criticize you. In asserting this constitutional right, we want to ask you the following questions. They are, and I'll, I'll edit these, there's a bunch of them. Um, why have you approved the sale of wheat and corn to our enemies when you know the communist soldiers travel on their stomachs? just as ours do. Communist soldiers are daily wounding or killing American soldiers in South Vietnam. Why'd you host and entertain Tito, Moscow's Trojan horse, just a short time after our sworn enemy, Khrushchev, embraced the Yugoslav dictator as a great hero and leader of communism? Why have you urged greater aid, comfort, recognition, understanding for Yugoslavia, Poland, Hungary, other communist countries while turning your back 
on the pleas of Hungarian, East German, Cuban, and other anti-communist freedom fighters? Why has Gus Hall, head of the U.S. Communist Party, praised almost every one of your policies and announced that the party will endorse and support your re-election in 1964? Why have you banned the showing at U.S. military bases of the film Operation Abolition, the movie by the House Committee on Un-American Activities exposing communism in America? Why have you ordered or permitted your brother Bobby, the Attorney General, to go soft on communists, fellow travelers, ultra-leftists in America while permitting him to persecute loyal Americans who criticize you, your administration, and your leadership? Why has the foreign policy of the United States degenerated to the point that the CIA is arranging coups and having staunch anti-communist allies of the U.S. bloodily exterminated? Why have you scrapped the Monroe Doctrine in favor of the spirit of Moscow? Mr. Kennedy, as citizens of the United States of America, we demand answers to these questions and we want them now. The American Fact-Finding Committee um, uh, anyway, that appeared in the Dallas Morning News the, uh, the, the day Kennedy got here. Not sure whether he ever saw it. He spent the night in Fort Worth and then came over in the morning, so I, I, I really don't know. Uh, but after his assassination, um, all of a sudden a lot of this kind of hostility to liberals uh, needed to be moderated. We, we had built up kind of a bad reputation. I experienced that bad reputation as a child. I, I was always guilty when I went to other parts of the country because uh, um, basically uh, I always thought they blamed us for shooting Kennedy. The, the irony of that whole situation was uh, my, my aunt, uh, the, the John Bircher, uh, knew Lee Harvey Oswald down in New Orleans. Uh, she said Oswald one week would hand out leftist tracks, another week would hand out rightist tracks. He was a little nuts. And, and fact is, he was, turns out to be the person who tried to assassinate General Walker. Uh, famous incident, nobody knew who had done it until later, but in October of 62, a year before the assassination of the president, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald had perched on the, the railroad tracks uh, across, uh, off Turtle Creek, across from uh, from General Walker's home. General Walker was sitting in his study with the curtains open, light on, full view. Oswald, who was a very good shot, um, took a shot. The bullet hit some metal on the window pane and deflected. They later traced that to be the weapon that shot John Kennedy. So a year before shooting Kennedy, Oswald had tried to shoot uh, one of the hard right conservatives in America, General Edwin Walker. Uh, Oswald was a uh, was a, a just a a, a, a a mentally tortured fellow. Uh, I had uh, uh, several people uh, b during the uh, 19, 19 uh, I guess it would have been the 2013. The 50th anniversary of the assassination had Hugh Ainsworth and had Jim Lavelle, who had been been handcuffed to Oswald, and um, there was no doubt in either one of their minds, and, and not in many other people's minds, despite all the conspiracy theories. Uh, Oswald was a loose cannon; he he was ready to shoot everybody. My aunt basically said that she knew him. I talked to his brother at one point, who was not able to come. Uh, he lived in Wichita Falls. He since died and said, who basically said his brother was tortured and ironically blamed his mother for that. Uh, but uh, he was just a tortured personality. But Dallas took the heat because of the, what was understood nationally as the political atmosphere that existed in Dallas uh, during this period of time. So it was really an unwarranted, uh, an, an unwarranted blame. But we felt it. And, and uh, I, I know I felt it. And so... So that moderated things a little. There has always been a, a paranoid streak in Dallas politics. It was, it was maybe, the most, uh, maybe the most pronounced back then. Uh, Dallas has now become very diverse, ethnically diverse, politically diverse. If you were doing blue and red, Dallas is blue. 
Uh, and so, so things have changed a lot, but the, the paranoid style, both in national politics and, and with a lot of local people, um, still exists. I talked to you about the, everybody who thinks George Soros caused uh, Floyd to die to, to, uh, to muddy the reputation of the president. Those kind of conspiracies now run rampant on the internet. But the point is, even before the internet, they ran rampant in Dallas uh, 50 plus years ago. Uh, they, they've always been with us. Uh, uh, Dallas politics has always been very interesting. I've, I uh, don't want to leave out the fact that uh, during the, the, the 1956 elections, uh, as Henry Wade was whistling Dixie and Bruce Alger was learning to take a more segregationist stance, uh, uh, the racial thing became maybe the most divisive thing of all, and it's playing out right now. But the racial thing uh, became particularly divisive um, because uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education was never entirely accepted, and bit by bit, inch by inch, uh, we've we've come to a broader understanding than we had then. But it's still there, and and. Uh, Dallas racial matters are, are still an unhealed wound, as is most of the nation. But, but that all comes out of that era. It still exists today. And, uh, and a result of that, what I want to talk about is that somebody else learned that kind of lesson that Bruce Alger learned in his race with Henry Wade, and that was Richard Nixon in 1960. That's where this word, the Southern strategy, comes from. It was already being practiced uh, by people like Bruce Alger and others in Texas, but Nixon was a fairly moderate on racial matters. Uh, but, but Nixon lost very narrowly in states like Illinois, very narrow. And Nixon blamed African Americans. Uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was in jail during that 1960 campaign. Uh, Nixon had been pretty moderate on civil rights stuff, but John Kennedy picked up the phone and, and said some things to Martin Luther King and took a public stance uh, that really influenced the black community. And Nixon was very resentful after that. He said, I supported those people and they turned on me. And he appropriated what had really started in this area of the country, Dallas included, the Southern strategy. And that is not to be overtly racist, but to dog whistle all kinds of things to people that were racially divisive. Um, and, and so basically you, you try to mobilize your white vote, even if you lose your black vote. Um, it, that Southern strategy got used in 60, Barry Goldwater used it in 64. Uh, uh, Nixon used it in a winning campaign in 68. He used it again in 72. It was used in 76. Reagan used it in 80 and in 84. It, it continued to exist. The, uh, the, the, the Southern strategy continued to exist. And so um, it, the effect of it was exacerbated in the 60s. Uh, Lyndon Johnson knew it when he did it but it was just the way history was headed. The Civil Rights Acts uh, of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, were highly resented in the South, highly resented, but Lyndon Johnson was a great, uh, was a great uh, person at, at uh, getting things through Congress. He had been the Senate Majority Leader before he became President. Uh, so those two things alienated the South. Uh, he knew it. He said, we've in the Democratic Party have lost the South for generations. And that actually came to be true. It, they, those were great civil rights landmarks, uh, you know, great steps forward in the, in the American civil rights story. But as you know, racial divisiveness is still very much with us. And the result of, the, of those pieces of legislation and the Southern strategy by the Republican Party has been that everything flipped. When I was born, Texas, they were conservative, but they were Democrats. All through the South, conservative Democrats, conservative Democrats. And now since all of this, what do you have? The South is red, always has been. And it's a result of the Southern strategy and a result of, of, of reaction to these civil rights laws. 
Now, it may be turning purple again. Uh, we're, we're in another great sea change, perhaps. We'll see. Uh, but but, but, but that's, what, that's what this author is talking about. He's saying the, the roots of Nixon's Southern strategy, the basic ideas were formed in this area in Bruce Alger's campaigns. Uh, this is where it kind of started. And that's not the only thing that started in this area. Um, um, you've heard of swift boating. Uh, you take the narrative of, of somebody's narrative of their heroic exploits or what they've done that they're most proud of, and you attack it. You say, oh, did that really happen? And as in the swift boat thing was during the Kerry, during the Kerry run for president in 2004, uh, you say, I'm not sure. I've talked to the veterans, and uh, here's a veteran who says he was there, and he doesn't remember seeing the man. So you attack a candidate at their greatest strength. That's swift boating. That started right here in Dallas with political operatives, and now is, was, is the granddaddy of fake news and of attacking uh, the, the very basis of what the facts are. And so we've had a very interesting history, and, and I think I'm going to wrap it up because there's really not much more to say except that, uh, except that maybe we can take some consolation from the fact uh, that even though the Internet age allows all kinds of paranoid, alternative, fake fact stuff, uh, deep state theories, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's part of the way we are. Even before the internet, it existed. It existed here in some of its strongest forms. And so things go up and they go down. And so we needn't lose faith in the fact that, uh, uh, you know, history moves forward even, even in these eras of paranoia. We have it now, but we had it then. And we didn't even have the internet then. So the history of Dallas is told in nut country, right-wing Dallas and the birth of the Southern strategy is fascinating. And for those of you who lived through it, uh, you will find some of the details uh, that you've forgotten really interesting. And so I, so I recommend uh, Edward H. Miller's Nut Country. Uh, thank you, and we'll see you next time.